Well, good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast for Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, November 21st, 2021. Hope you're having a great weekend. I'll be joined today by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news this week in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of the RN Sunday. Well, we're going to kick things off with a look at technology and consumer products and all things in between. Joining me on the line, he's lead advisor, executive producer for Seven Investing. We're talking about Daniel Klein. Dan, great to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Good morning, Jeff. Very happy to be here. So, Dan, I got to ask you before we start, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Um, I don't like Thanksgiving at all. I'm hosting Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've had this discussion. <laughs> If turkey was good, we'd eat it more often. So now, if I had my choice, I'm hosting Thanksgiving. I'd serve like prime rib or something, mm -hmm. but I am not allowed to do that. I have purchased a turkey. Uh, I will be serving turkey. But yeah, to me, Thanksgiving is, wait, we're having a big special meal and we're not getting lobsters? Like, what is going on here? Um, so yeah, I, 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 look, I'm very excited. My, my family here is older. I haven't seen much of them because of the pandemic. So that aspect I'm very excited about, but the food, not so much. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, we can, you're giving away your new England roots and your bias. Dan, let's talk about Black <laughs> Friday because along with Thanksgiving comes Black Friday sales and our friends at, they're not really our friends, but we want them to be our friends at Amazon uh, are starting their Black Friday sale on Thanksgiving. What can you tell us? I have friends at Amazon. A lot of ex-Microsoft colleagues work at Amazon. But uh, yeah, so Black Friday has been ongoing since like, I don't know, September. Like, it, it is a very strange year. So there are some specific savings on Black Friday. So if you're an Amazon fan and you need to pick up a bunch of new Echo Dots, that might be Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Those might be your best times to do it. But here's the reality. It's a very strange holiday season, and you need to make a list. You need to have a sense of what you're going to buy and what it should cost. And when you see it for around that price, you probably want to buy it. But understand what your pricing protocols are. Know if you're buying it someplace uh, that if they drop the price a week later, we'll refund you the difference. Know, you know, sort of uh, be aware of it. And if you're buying something like a big screen TV and you manage to find the rare deal, like I saw a 70 inch TV for $3.99 yesterday, which last year would have not been a great deal, but this year would be a very good deal. If I buy that, I might check that specific model on the specific website I bought it from, but I would not keep checking other places and feel bad if, you know, three weeks later or the week before Christmas, somebody buys it for $6.50. Like, I think this is a year you're just going to have to let that go because supply chains are constrained and pricing is very hard to predict. And if you wait, you might not get what you want. Yeah, but is that, is that such a bad thing, Dan? I mean, I feel like, you know, we've been – We've been during the pandemic. A lot of us learned to be more disciplined with our spending. That seems to, have, you know, by all indications, credit card spending has ticked up. The buy now, pay later trend has also reared its head. Uh, if I can't get a good, and you know, do I buy a replacement or do I wait until that good is available? Is that such a bad thing? I mean, shouldn't it be, hey, so, let's so, all get along with our, our our families and whatnot? So it's a question. Let's say you don't want a television. You need a television. The main television in your living room broke. Mm -hmm. At that point, I think your best prices are going to be, let's call it the vague Black Friday season, now through like January 1st. So if it's something you need, like an appliance in the house, you're probably going to want to buy, even if it means getting not exactly what you want. If it's something you want, like an Xbox or something where the price doesn't particularly vary, uh, you don't don't pay a premium for it. If you have to wait till February, wait till February. Uh, but if it's something like a mattress that that you know you're not willing to wait for Labor Day, which is probably the next time you get a big mattress sale, well, then you probably have to buy it. There are things you know like those Amazon devices I was talking about mm -hmm. that will be significantly cheaper, but I'm not so sure those are things that are going to be out of stock. If you need a laptop and you can't get the laptop you want, 
prices probably aren't going to vary that much. I mean, Apple usually has a bit of a sale, but when I say a bit of a sale, I mean, buy like a new $1,300 MacBook, get like a $50 iTunes gift card or, or, or App Store gift card. So these are not huge savings. So if you can't get the configuration or the model you want, I actually think for a lot of big ticket items, it's absolutely okay to wait. And for kids' toys, I think this is really important. I've talked about this a lot. Teaching kids the lesson of, hey, you're going to get what you want. I know you want that doll. I know you want that whatever, but it's not in stock, and I'm not going to go punch other parents in the face to get it. I think that's an important <laughs> lesson to teach your kids, to give them an IOU and say, hey, you're going to get this as soon as we can possibly find it at what the price should be because those shortages go away after the holidays. Yeah, Dad, do you remember what you just said reminds me back when Star Wars figures first came out, and you – you and I are a little bit different in age. I think I'm a little bit older than you are, but I remember you could buy the stand, and it, it was like in a box, and in a box, and it told you, you know, one, you know, the, the figures weren't available for the Christmas holidays or the, you know, the holidays, and so it was like an IOU, and so it was like probably one of the best um, gimmicks of all time in that people laid down money and it said we will give you the ten Star Wars figures, Luke, Han, all that kind of stuff. Do you remember that? So I, I know of it historically. Do you know why that happened? I just thought they couldn't produce the, the stuff. Yeah, like it's because Star Wars was never expected to be a big a big money movie. And the reality is back in the, the early 70s, it wasn't like every movie got this run of toys because the ability to produce toys, like right now, you and I could be like a, a relatively small, like, you know, like a, a, a cartoon on a show on a channel that gets 200,000 viewers and we could produce toys because you could produce one offs you could produce on demand like most uh you know t-shirts for say like individual pro wrestlers or, or other people are produced on demand so there's a much larger selection back when they were making those Star Wars toys if they were going to make Luke they had to make like 3 million Lukes or or whatever the number was to make it make sense to make those molds and all the other things so that was just simply a really, really smart solution to, oh, my God, we're not ready for this. Um, happened a little bit recently with Baby Yoda uh, because, if you remember, releasing Baby Yoda toys would have kind of ruined the surprise. So they missed the holiday season. But then there was incredible pent-up demand, which they didn't expect because it was post-holiday season. So it does still happen. Um, back in my toy store running days, you know, there were absolutely things that it was like a struggle to keep in stock, but certainly nothing like the old Cabbage Patch Kids days. Oy, oy, Cabbage Patch Kids. That's a little bit past my youth. All right, Dan, let's change gears. You know, a lot of people have a broken, maybe have broken their iPhone, um, and they're like, ah, oh, now I got to go to Apple either to replace it or repair it. But it looks like Apple has come up with a do it do it yourself repair solution, at least for Apple, uh, what is it, uh, iPhone 11 and 12 or 12 it's, it's, and 13? It's, it's iPhone 12 and 13 and, and laptops with the M1 chip. And I would say, no, they haven't. This is cosmetic. This is an incredibly misreported story. Um, why do I say that, Jeff? Um, you have to be a qualified repair technician to actually make the repairs. Apple doesn't define what that means. But if you or I go out and buy these kits, and, and there, it does come with some instruction, and we mess up, it voids our warranty. Mm. So this is slightly good for third-party repair shops, which are already repairing your Apple devices. And arguably, if those shops can prove they're qualified, it means that them working on your phone doesn't void the warranty. But how many people do you know that went to like an Apple Fix-It store at the mall and they broke their phone and they then had to file a warranty claim. Those shops are largely good and, and trained. So this is very cosmetic. This is very Apple. There, there's a lot of uh, uh, federal regulators who are pushing for this. But this isn't like, hey, I couldn't change something that actually I could totally change and it's no problem. This is like I can't work with like the microscope to change these chips. Like this is a real issue. You shouldn't be replacing your own iPhone screen or any of these things. So for consumers, this matters almost zero. Dan, I don't even know where to go with this. I mean, I, I, I guess the, when I read the story that you had sent me and, and kind of thought about it, um, you know, I thought about the original Macintosh and the Macintosh were all out. It was in 83, 84 where Steve Jobs um, basically said, 
uh, we're going to have a special uh, screwdriver and special bolts to open this thing up. And I feel like, you know, it's very proprietary. I don't think as a regular consumer, you want people rooting around and making changes on a device. As you said, you could void the warranty. I, look, I like the idea of having a qualified third party option. So like, you know, a Best Buy is probably like an official Apple repair place. But if I went to a, a place at the mall that I knew the guy was trained, Apple repairs are incredibly expensive. My, my 2016 MacBook went in uh, for, for some minor repair and they came back to me and said, well, there's water in it. You have to fix this and that. It was like 750 bucks. It was like three quarters the cost of buying a new one. And if I'd thought about it, I would have just bought a new one, but I, but I needed it back. So I didn't really think about it. Um, having the option of going to someone who says, yeah, there's water in it, but it works fine. So don't fix it or, or whatever it might be. Apple is very expensive to deal with. So I do think, you know, at, at some very marginal level, this could be beneficial, but the reality is Apple products don't break that much. Uh, you know, there, I've had very few problems and I, I own three different, uh, about to be four different Macs, um, so I just don't think this is that big a deal. Mm -hmm. Don't slam your iPhone on the ground or, or you know, submerge it. Actually, submerging it doesn't even matter anymore. That would That's fine. So <laughs> if you have a newer iPhone, please don't submerge your iPhones because Dan said so. Um, you know, this is one of those things where uh, it's very cosmetic. It's very like, you know, Congress will be like, oh, look, Apple has right to repair. Like, that's great. You shouldn't repair it. It's 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 you know, Jeff. When you and I had our first cars, like I know nothing about cars, and I could like do stuff in my car. Now you got to be like a robot with a special robot computer to to fix my my Prius. Like you know, I think the world is different. I'm not sure anybody should be repairing their own iPhone at home. Yeah, well, it sounds like a can of worms that I don't I wouldn't open either, Dan. Dan Klein, always a pleasure chatting with you. Wishing you a very Happy Thanksgiving, even though you hate the holiday or don't like the holiday, dislike the holiday or the food. Enjoy time. Yeah, I, di I dislike the food. I enjoy the gathering and family gathering. and the uh, NFL aspect of it. It's just turkey. Uh, I'm sorry. And I know I'm going to get hate mail. So at Worst Idea 7 on Twitter, uh, send me your hate mail. Yeah, there you go. And uh, be wary of Trip the Fan. All right, Dan, great talk with you. Have a great holiday, and we'll talk to you again next week. Jeff, I'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Welcome back, and now we're going to talk a little healthcare. Joining us on the line, she is the healthcare editor for Business Insider. You can also find her as the editor of Dispensed, a great newsletter consolidating, curating all the great news each week in healthcare. Talking about Lydia Ramsey Flanzer. Lydia, great to talk to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Great to talk to you. Uh, before we start, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? I, I've been asking all the guests this week about that. So, what's your favorite? <laughs> Oh, it's so hard. It's, I'm definitely one of those. It, it has to all go together. But I think one of my favorite things as I've gotten older has been roasted veggies of any type. Um, that's always been so much fun to, to enjoy on the holiday. <laughs> very and, and very healthy, I might add. All right, Lydia, let's let's jump in because uh, I did an interview this week with AAA, Andy, Andrew Gross of AAA. 53 million people are going to be traveling, I think, majority through – car, but there's going to be 10 million people traveling or give or take by air. Are there some tips or things that people need to think about or reminders about COVID and healthcare, uh, keeping themselves safe when they hit the road? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot to think about. Um, one is just thinking about um, where COVID cases are in the U.S. Um, it seems like for a lot of places, cases are on the rise. I'm based in Colorado and, and our case count has been going up. Our hospitals are pretty full at the moment. Uh, so it's something I keep in mind when, when thinking about traveling. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a bunch of ways, you know, we're, we're basically almost two years into this pandemic. There's a lot we know about how to do travel safely. Um, one thing is, you know, still in airports and, and elsewhere, masks are still mandated. Um, so that's, that's always good, you know, to keep your mask on, um, when, when you're in kind of places where you can't get a lot of good airflow, like an airplane um, or a train or, or things like that, it, it's good to, to have masks on in those environments. Um, and one idea that I thought was kind of interesting that I heard about just yesterday was the idea of bringing kind of rapid tests wherever you're mm. going. <laughs> Someone positioned it as kind of like a gift for the host, um, but <laughs> it, it would be good to, you know, check in and, and say, okay, 
I am indeed negative and, and just, you know, tests are pretty widely available. It's totally kind of case by case, but I was, we were able to find some the other day when we needed to. And um, that's, that's a huge help. And that's definitely something we didn't really have as, as available last Thanksgiving. Yeah, really, really good idea. And I think, look, all of us want to get out, want to see family. I know I'm going to my in-laws um, up just up the road, 90 minutes up the road for Thanksgiving. But people need to remember we're entering the cooler months um, that's typically the flu season, right? And I would imagine that if we don't protect ourselves and each other, we could see an e- even more of an increased spread. So probably wearing, wearing a mask, like you said, uh, in those airports, on those planes. But, you know, be be aware. And I think that's what we can't drop our guard, I guess, is my point, Lydia. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, something that, you know, the state of Colorado is doing, and then just this morning, the FDA kind of, authorize this on a national level. Um, it is probably hard to get a booster shot before the holiday. We're kind of in that window where um, probably a lot of appointments are booked up. But the FDA this morning said that uh, boosters are available to all adults over 18. Um, that's people who have gotten two doses of Pfizer. You can get a third dose now. It doesn't have to be Pfizer. Um, I, on Monday, got boosted with another dose of Moderna. So that was nice. Um, my antibodies are up and ready to go. Um, and so that, you know, now that these are available, these extra doses, um, it doesn't hurt to get that extra boost of immunity. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I guess people can log in online, check your local pharmacy, right? That you can go to your pharmacy, uh, clinics, um, alert clinics, things like that to get the, the booster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly important for people to take the right precautions. And uh, look, I, I think the only way through this is to protect each other and protect ourselves. Um, and, and doing the right thing makes a lot of sense. Well, Lydia, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much for uh, joining us in the program and wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. Safe travels to wherever you're going. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thanks so much. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, Lydia. All right. Bye. Welcome back. Now we're going to end the show with a look at what's going on in Capitol Hill. And surprise, surprise, there are some things going on. But who to break this down better? Who could break this down better than David Levine, Kevin Walsh? Both are principals with Groom Law Group, an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. And they're also better known as the hashtag Legal Eagles. Gentlemen, great to talk to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Happy Thanksgiving. It's always good to be on the on the program. You know, we've been talking a lot about what's been going on on the Hill um, with the legislators. But, you know, with uh, with Thanksgiving rapidly approaching, uh, they're looking to get out of town. So I, we were thinking this week we might we might pivot over, you know, across the street from the Senate um, and talk a little bit about what's going on at the Labor Department, and a little bit about what's going on at uh, Treasury and IRS. Well, great. Well, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, Diwali, Eid to everybody. We're not there yet, David. Yet. Come on. We got We can't we can't waste our holiday greetings in, in, in November. Hey, this is a trademark of mine, hashtag Levine. Since, since Jeff is doing hashtags, I'm throwing out hashtags like a Netflix reality show this morning. Uh, I, Sorry. If, if only, Jeff. Uh, if, David, I, David, that might be one yes? of the stranger things I've heard. I, well, well that, 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 is, that is true. It's kind of like watching Narcos. But let's keep going forward. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the IRS this morning. The IRS, we're heading towards the end of the year. Kevin and I are prognosticating here. But there's one thing that we really, really think is coming soon. And, 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 you know, we all get tired sometimes of hearing people say soon. And you probably tire of us saying that, too. But this is real. As many of you know who've stuck with us over these years, you, we, we spent a long time talking about the SECURE Act. When was it going to pass? When was it going to become law? Was it ever going to pass? It was great for dozens of segments, and thank you, Jeff, for that. Uh, but one big piece of secure was the raising of the required minimum distribution, uh, required beginning date rules. We had to start taking money out of your IRA or your 401k or your pension. But most importantly, for this is defined contribution plans. This change, uh, they, were, they raised the rule to age 72 across all benefit plans for when you have to start taking your money out. But there was there's a whole bunch of new rules that talk about do you have to take the money out within 10 years if you're not a spouse, 
and and the, and the owner of the I, uh, the 401k dies. What about certain types of trusts? What if you're a minor beneficiary? It gets really wonky really fast. But here's the reality. And David, the the, and yes. David by, minor, by minor beneficiary, you mean a, a beneficiary under the age of maturity, not a not a beneficiary who works underground, right? Uh, that that is that is correct. Although if we're really going to have some fun with this, Kevin, they could be under the age of maturity and work underground. But I think there are labor laws allowed that, and that's not our topic today. So I'll go back to what I was talking about. But you're you're 100 percent correct. There are state labor laws probably on this, and Jeff, we could do a whole segment on that some other time. But the key is, how do you apply these rules? They are messy and there is rumors of 100 200 pages of regulations for rules that people are already grappling with except for governmental plans have a little bit delayed effective date into next year but they're very interested in this and we're waiting for all these regulations to come out if i had to pick one thing that i think might happen it might be that now to show you how how complex these rules are there are some very very smart people at the irs been working on this at the same time there's a publication like the sort of plain English IRS guides that came out on some of these rules earlier this year, this, this year, just so people had some basic understanding. And even there, there were some hiccups. They actually had to pull it back and revise it because these rules are just so complex. So short answer, if you have someone, you or someone you know is 70, it's going to be like 72 or in minimum distribution land, these rules can mean something to you. But we're going to have to wait and see what it says. Now, Kevin. Tell me everything the DOL is guaranteed. I want like a real level of opinion here to put out by the end of the year. Okay, so so for me, there's a couple of you know take it to the bank items, um, I, and and by that I mean I high probability because I don't think anything really is taken to the bank. Um, first, and it's not really regulation, so this is a layup. Um, DOL is increasingly focused on cybersecurity in plan investigations. Um, I was talking is, with an Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. Kevin, I said will, and I said regulation. Now you're giving me okay. enforcement? Come on. Uh, we're likely to see a, uh, a notice of pre-rulemaking uh, related to the government's retirement plans and their use of ESG. Um, we're likely to see something you know, on that probably in mid-December. Uh, there's a, a rule pending or a, a pre-rule pending over at OMB right now, so being reviewed by the White House. Um, so I, I I think that one's probably a safe bet because we still have, you know, 40 some odd days before we get to the end of the year. Um, everything else is is kind of a, a mixed bag. Uh, we know that the DOL is working on an ESG rule, environmental social governance investing rule. Um, there's a comment period on that that's ongoing. Based on that, I, I, it's pretty unlikely that we'll see a final rule there by the end of the year. But, you know, it's always worth, you know, keeping your eyes open, keeping your ears open and, um, you know, listening and watching what's going on there. Um, and other than that, we, we're aware that, you know, in their workshop, um, they've got um, a number of folks who are focused on fiduciary, which is a topic that is near and dear to most people's hearts. Uh, it was done initially in, hey, in the, the mid Hey, yep. Hey, Kevin, I got to ask a question. You said workshop. Since we're talking end of year, is it like Santa's workshop? <laughs> uh, it's a lot like Santa's workshop. That was, that was what I was referencing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not quite the North Pole, but it's, uh, it's, it's just north of the capital. It, wait, wait, is it a North, you know, the, and this is for anybody who was following the Obama administration. Is it's it not the North, North Pole, but it's North Capital. But is it a North Star? What, a true fiduciary? Yes, exactly. It, 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 in many ways, in many ways. They, they, yeah, they're focused on a fiduciary principle that can, can, can provide a true North uh, and guide people in that direction. Uh, that being said, I mean, I, I think it's important to recognize there's many different methods for providing uh, financial services and investment advice. Uh, but, yeah, so I think the last thing that, I, I, that we know that they're working on, it's a big deal, so I, I don't think we'll see it this year, but we'll probably see it early next year, um, relates to fiduciary status and possibly a, a tinkering with uh, or complete overhaul of, of some of the exemptions that folks have relied on for, you know, 40-some-odd years now. Gentlemen, uh, that, that sounds that, – go, go ahead, Dave. Minor. Sorry, sorry, Jeff. That sounds really small, Kevin. I can't imagine why it will take more time. I'm, I, I'm having fun here. But Jeff, cut me off. No, I don't want to cut you off, but I, I wanted to ask, you know, past performance is not prologue, uh, doesn't guarantee future results. That's a disclaimer we often hear in the retirement industry. But when you look back to the to last year or 2020 or 2019, what what is the likelihood that we get some level of regulation? I, I don't, you know, just ballpark. 
I'm not oh, asking you to guarantee well, anything. What time period? I, what by time the end of the year. By the end of the year. He gave us the most easy softball. He said, some regulation. Now we get to be like lawyers. Jeff, there is a guarantee that we will get some regulation from the federal government by December 31st, 2021. Well, I think the audience can see that I'm clearly outclassed, outmaneuvered by uh, two of the best benefits lawyers, and I do I dare say lawyers, in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, always a pleasure chatting with you. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll talk to you again next week. Talk to you next week, Jeff. Thanks, listeners. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye, guys. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. We're backing in tomorrow for BRN AM. We'll have a very special guest. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. <laughs>